Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Brennan. Wait, I got to try to just always forget that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Brennan. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I want to welcome you to our hearing on Governor's Island today. Uh, I also want to extend my thanks to my, my good colleague, Council Member Koo, who chairs the Parks and Recreation Committee, for joining me today. Uh, this hearing will provide our committees with an opportunity to hear from the Trust uh, for Governor's Island, the Governor's Island uh, National Monument, advocates and tenants on the island about ongoing proposed uh, construction projects, plans for future tenants, and the new passenger ferry that went into effect uh, this past summer. The Council has historically conducted regular hearings on Governor's Island to learn about ongoing developments and use of the island. Since it has been a few years since our last update, our committees look forward to hearing uh, from all the parties here today. Governor's Island is located about two miles from where we are uh, here at 250 Broadway. It's currently open to the public from May 1st till October 31st. In 2003, the federal government sold 150 of the island's 172 acres to the city of New York, with the remaining 22 acres declared the Governor's Island National Monument, overseen by the National Park Service. The island is home to an award-winning park, historic buildings, the New York Harbor School, and cultural facilities. In July, the Trust for Governor's Island added a new 400-passenger ferry to its fleet. In this past September, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council opened a 40,000-square-foot art center that includes artist studios, galleries, performance spaces, and a cafe. Visitors to Governor's Island enjoy biking and walking along the Great Promenade, playing and relaxing on one of the four hills, and taking in breathtaking views of the city and New York Harbor. What will the island look like in the next few years? In 2016, Mayor de Blasio announced plans to transform Governor's Island into a year-round destination. And in August of last year, the city initiated the public review process to rezone approximately 33 acres on the southern portion of the island to create up to 4.5 million square feet of new development. In October, the New York Times reported that the Trust is considering developing a center for climate adaption research and has reached out to consultants to help uh, study this idea. Additional uses being considered include a hotel, dorms, a university, convention center, offices, and retail space. It is very important that whatever development does occur on the island, that the island remains open and accessible to all members of the public <coughs> and not just the select few who can afford these new recreational opportunities. So we look forward to hearing where the trust is uh, in this process and how the trust will balance the need to fund operations on the island with the need for open space. We also look forward to hearing how uh, additional development will account for the effects of climate change, specifically sea level rise, coastal surge, and flooding. Will 4.5 million square feet of new development stress the island's current infrastructure? What resiliency measures will be considered? How will tenants, residents, and visitors be evacuated in the case of an emergency? Although we may be early in the, these planning stages, the Trust must consider all these factors and issues as it proceeds through the environmental review and rezoning process. So before I begin, uh, I want to, of course, thank my committee staff, committee counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, um, senior policy analyst Patrick Mulville, senior finance analyst Jonathan Seltzer, and my senior advisor Jonathan Yedden, and of course, council staff from the Parks and Recreation Committee uh, for putting, for all the hard work in putting this hearing together. So I now want to uh, turn it over to council member Koo for his opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Chair Bannon. Good morning. I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Council's uh, Committee on Parks and Recreation. I'd like to thank Council Member James uh, Bannon, Chair of the Committee on Resiliencies and Water Funds, for agreeing to hold this joint meeting. Today's meeting will examine the status and plans for development on Governance Island. The council has typically studied uh, con no, the council has typically conducted periodic hearings on the progress made on the governor islands because we know 
that this island holds so much promise from an educational, historical, and recreation uh, point of view. Governor Island has a long and distinguished history in the New York City first, serving as a military base from the late 1700s until the late 1600s. <coughs> then a Coast Guard facility until 1996, and most recently as a recreational area for New Yorkers. In 2003, ownership of the island was transferred to New York City from the federal government, and the island was jointly managed by National Park Service and the Governor's Island Preservation and Educational Cooperation, a non-profit co uh, corporation formed for the purpose of without redeveloping and managing the island. Ultimately, the Trust for Governor's Island was created in 2010 and is responsible for all overall operations and redevelopment of the island. After, uh, while the U.S. National Park Service is responsible for various his, uh, historic buildings and monuments on the island. Ever since the city gained control over the island, numerous ideas have been proposed on what, if any, development should occur. It is important to note that as part of the transfer from the federal government, a series of, de uh, of deep restrictions were imposed. For example, the island must remain accessible to public in, per in perpetuity and at least 90 acres must be used for parkland, educational and open space uses, and no residential development may occur. <clears throat> Over the years, as the island became a more attractive destination uh, from a recreational and historical point of view, uh, with the creation of the hills, park, uh, various event programming, and restoration of historic buildings. Additionally, various organizations rooted themselves on the island, including the Billion Oyster Project, the Harbor School, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, with the goal of making the use of the island for cultural, educational, and environmental purposes. The ultimate purpose of this island is still up for debate and consideration, with most agreeing that it should continue to serve the various purposes that have been associated with the island since the city took over. However, development of the south side of the island remains unclear. The mayor in 2016 a launch a plan to make the south side of the island into an innovation center, bringing together innovations, entrepreneurs, and educators to generate new ideas and, and economic uh, activities. The plan also called for keeping the island open year round with the hope that it will create several billion square feet of educational, cultural, research, and retail uses. Since then, the city initiated the public review process for rezoning the south side in order to, uh, in order to develop about 4.5 million square feet for commercial, academic, and cultural purposes. I, like, I would like this hearing to explore uh, what the island's financial status is and the likelihood of it being financially self-sustaining for the long term, and whether the various efforts of revenue generations through attracting uh, various commercial establishments have been successful. I would also like to explore how generated revenue is being used to create and maintain parkland and recreational spaces for the island's visitors. The committee will also examine the status 
The committee will also examine what the status is regarding various infrastructure projects, such as construction of portable water pipes, the possibility of expanding recreational boulder access to the island, and whether there are plans to expand ferry service to more areas of the city. I hope this hearing will provide more insight into the status of the island's operation, and I look forward to learning more about the development propositions, uh, current uh, funding issues, and the concerns of advocates, businesses, and the general public. Thank you once again, and welcome. Thank you, Chair Q. Um, and with that, I will now turn the floor over to Claire Newman and Sarah Kranheim from the Trust for Governor's Island. If you can please raise your right hand so council can swear you in today. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Absolutely. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, great. And now my microphone's on. Um, and I'm joined by Sarah Krautheim, our VP of Public Affairs, to assist with any questions. Um, starting off, oh, and prior to that, um, I know some people in this room from my stint at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I was the chief of staff there for five years immediately before starting at the Trust. Um, starting off with our mission, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit, and as alluded to in the opening remarks, our mission is really to make sure that Governor's Island is an extraordinary public place and resource for New Yorkers, and that would has guided our work since the city took control of the asset all of those years ago and remains really at the center of everything that we do on the island, from operations and maintenance to programming and to the future growth. Um, we have a very fascinating history on the island, and I do think it's worth talking a little bit about because it provides some important context for the conversation today. Um, the island has always been a really strategic location in the New York Harbor, and in very early days, it was used by the Lenape as a fishing and hunting camp, um, and was ultimately then used as a military base um, really for close to 200 years from about early 1800s till the mid-1900s. In the mid-1900s, the Coast Guard took over, and they operated the facility from 1966 to 1996. What was really fascinating about the Coast Guard days is that the island operated as really a totally self-sustaining facility. And so there were 3,000 Coast Guard families living on the island, and they had everything they needed out there, a supermarket, a uh, Burger King, a bowling alley, 12, 14-story tall barracks where families lived and worked. And so the island has a, a, a very long-term history of being this sort of multi-purpose, multi-use place that can sustain 24-7, 365 operations. Um, the Coast Guard departed in 1996, and um, since that time, there's been quite a bit of planning for the island. Um, it was sold to a joint entity of the city and state in 2003 for $1. And then ultimately, it was transitioned from that joint control into full city control in 2010. Um, and during that period, the city has made extraordinary strides in terms of what the island is and can be for New Yorkers. Uh, where we are today, um, as mentioned, the island is owned and operated by us, the mission-driven trust for Governor's Island. Um, as Chairman Ku alerted to, there are deed restrictions that were passed to us from the sale of the federal government. Those are uh, noted up here. But the important thing is that we really manage everything that happens on the island day in and day out. And so we run and pay for most of the ferry service. We own and operate all the infrastructure and um, the pedestrian pathways around the island, in addition to the open space and the 1.3 million square feet of historic resources that exist on the island today. Um, 
I like to tell the story of when I first went to Governor's Island, which was about 12 years ago. And at that time, it really was sort of like a very spooky, um, but also incredibly gorgeous uh, ghost town in the sense that the Coast Guard had, uh, you know, basically walked out the door um, and dropped their keys at the footsteps of each building and said bye bye. And so it had this real frozen in time feel. Um, but you could tell even back then driving around the island in a tram that the island had extraordinary potential. And for me, I'm a born and raised New Yorker. I had never heard of Governor's Island, let alone been there. And so the idea that there was this resource in the center of the harbor that could be reopened to New Yorkers was exciting even then. Um, and what I've been extremely excited by in starting in this role is to flash forward that decade and just see how much that has changed in that 10 year period. Um, what do we attribute that to? Re really three core things that the city and leadership at the trust has been working on. Uh, first, the city has invested close to $300 million into the island. And so a lot of that went to building a truly world-class public open space and park. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the resiliency plans as part of the park. But it also went into core infrastructure for the island. And so we're proud to say that now today we do have potable water and we have such exotic luxuries as electricity. Um, we also have built strong educational and cultural partnerships with tenants and programming entities. Um, and it's with them that we really bring life to the island and help to draw visitorship to the island. And we'll talk as well about those partnerships. And then third, and really anchoring everything that we do and at the core of all of our work, is this idea of building this public resource and attracting a diverse mix of New York City residents to the island. And so we have grown from our opening season of about 8,000 visitors a summer to this year we had over 750,000 visitors. And so we're very proud to say that, you know, we think we have succeeded in helping to put Governor's Island on the mental map of New Yorkers and to really stitch it back into the fabric of the city. Um, so we'll focus on that to start. What is it we do in terms of public access and in terms of tra attracting visitors? Um, as mentioned, we grew from that early figure of about 8,000 visitors to the 750 today. Over the course of the 13 or so years we've been open, six million people have visited the island. And each year on average, we increase visitorship by about 12%. Um, you know, sometimes there's jumps and flatter periods, but that's the blended average. Um, we're extremely proud of the fact that over 80% of our visitors come from the five boroughs of the city. And that's a very strong number for a sort of destination um, facility like we operate. And it's really proof that this is succeeding in its goal to be a resource for the city. Um, and then I also want to highlight that one in two were repeat visitors. So one thing we find found and we continue to look at this is that once people come to the island, they want to come back again and again. And so we have a balancing act in both attracting new audience, but then also making sure that we have those folks who've been before and love it. When they come back, there's continually new things to explore, and we continue to deliver on the promise of having an extraordinary time. Um, but all of that, of course, starts with access. Um, Governor's Island can be visited by ferry. The main route that people take to and from the island is from the Battery Maritime Building located in Lower Manhattan. Um, the great thing about that facility is it's highly accessible by subway and other forms of public transit, including bus. Um, from there, it's about an eight minute ferry ride to the island and the Trust for Governor's Island operates that service. As mentioned earlier in the preamble, we did launch a new ferry earlier this summer and what that has allowed us to do is increase weekend frequency to serve uh, the Battery Maritime Building every 20 minutes. And that's been a huge thing for visitors. It means that they can come, they don't have to worry about the schedule, the boat's gonna be there within a relatively reasonable waiting time and they can come enjoy the island. In addition, we run on the weekends in public season a shuttle to Brooklyn, to Pier 6, and we are connected by a shuttle route to the New York City Ferry, which leaves from Pier 11 also on summer weekends. And so people can use any New York City ferry line, take it to Pier 11, and then transfer to the Governor's Island Shuttle. Um, today, our ferry service is run, as I said, from BMB. It is $3 round trip. Um, 
it is free before noon on the weekends. It's free for all uh, people under the age of 12 and to ID NYC holders. And so we do as much as we can to make sure that the island remains accessible in terms of ferry pricing as well. Our public events and programs, we had over 80 in this past public season. It helps us to attract audience and to keep the island lively. Of those 80 programs, 70 were free public events. And so again, the vast majority of what happens on the island day in and day out is open and accessible to the public. And so you can come, sp the, spend the day, explore the island, and know that almost everything you're going to happen upon is something you can explore with your family. One of the main areas that we have a focus is in arts and culture. Um, and I should say too that each season what we do is we issue an RFP to the nonprofit community of New York City and we basically offer up the houses that are located in Nolan Park and along Colonel's Row for free for nonprofits who are willing to do weekend public programming. And so each season we select close to 30 partner entities who come and occupy those spaces. Um, you can see some of the examples up here and there'll be more on further slides, but they range from Makata, which is an arts organization, to Pioneer Works, which is Arts Meet the Environment. And they run these houses with extraordinary programming that supports their mission and they make sure that on the weekends there's something great happening on the ground floor that the public can wander into. We also have many of these partnerships focused in science and the environment. And so the Climate Museum has one of these houses. And they did an extraordinary amount of programming this summer, really focused on activating youth um, to think about figuring out solutions to climate and becoming real climate advocates themselves. Another example um, actually here today is Earth Matters New York's Compost Learning Center who operates on the island and again focused in the science and environment and offering programming for the public. We have a strong base as well in kids programming and so you know it ranges from STEM kids who is focused on science, technology, engineering and mathematics to Children's Museum of the Arts which is focused on the arts um, all the way to Art Force 5 which is a great public program focused on crafts and arts for children as well. And these operate across the island um, during the six month public season. The trust has a long history in commissioning public artworks. And so this is something that we've done really th since the island's inception to make sure that we're bringing life to these acres that we operate. And each season we select a couple of public artworks. Um, we look to solicit grant funds from the private sector and we actually commission these works. What it means is that as people come to the island and they're exploring it, they get to really begin to feel the island in a way that is different than just a standard open space where you can turn around a corner and encounter some fabulous cutting edge public artwork. Again, totally free. Similarly, and you'll see this theme continues, we have a strong base in recreation. Uh, we have bike rental facility on the island. Um, we have an agreement with that bike rental company that allows them to rent bikes uh, for free on weekdays before noon. Um, the downtown boathouse operates free kayaking from the island. And then we have fabulous fields across the island, soccer, football, softball, baseball. Again, totally free to use uh, if you're visiting the island. And then we also have grills, which, you know, um, especially for, um, I'm sure Chairman Koo hears a lot of this, people love having access to grills in the parks. And we offer that really across the island, north and south, for families to come spend the entire day doing a barbecue, a picnic, whatever. Um, National Park Service is not here today, but as alluded to, of the 172 acre island, we own and operate 150 acres. The Park Service owns and operates 22. We work in very, very close communication with them um, to make sure that we are holding hands on all of the public tours and that their facilities continue also to be an extraordinary resource for the city. And so Fort Jay and Castle Williams, which are both national monuments, are open on the weekends for free to the public and the Park Service offers tours of those. We work very closely with the Friends of Governor's Island on visitor services across the board to make sure that people coming to the island have the information they need to enjoy a full day. We translate our guides uh, both on paper and on the website into four languages. 
Um, we offer through the fr with the friends 250 free tours um, every single season um, to members of the public, and we have welcome centers and information centers located across the island to help guide visitors to everything that the island has to offer. And then in 2020, we're very excited to announce, thanks to the support of ca our council member Chin, that we will be launching a free eco shuttle to help uh, visitors get around the island as quickly, easily, and seamlessly as possible. These are electric vehicles. Um, they will operate on a fixed route throughout the island, um, serving both as a means of transportation, but also will be um, offering tours and information as you're on the shuttle. Again, we'll be working on that with the Friends of Governor's Island. We're starting with two, and we'll see how that goes. And if there's need to add more in the future, we are committed to doing that to ensure, again, that visitors can navigate the island easily. And then it's very important to us that everything we do here in terms of outreach, in terms of programming, we are doing in partnership with our community stakeholders. And so we uh, run a community advisory council. Some of the participants in the council are uh, listed on the screen. Our elected officials participate in that. Island tenants and partners participate in that. And then um, various advocates from across the city who are interested in the future of Governor's Island also participate. This really helps us make sure that what we are delivering on the island is staying true to what people actually want out there. And so the purpose of these is to make sure that we are staying on track and that we are making real-time adjustments as needed to all that the island has to do. So this is a really important way that we're getting feedback in addition to um, the survey work that the Friends of collects from visitors, in addition to our kind of hearings like this and our meetings with elected officials to make sure that we're staying true to our mission. Um, we know the council was, uh, the committee was very interested in hearing a little bit about resiliency, and so we focus here on um, the park that we developed recently and various resiliency efforts on the island. Um, the park was the result of a 2010 master plan that was developed for the island, and uh, this is important to rest on for a second. As you can see, the island sort of has two halves. Um, on the northern part up here, this is a New York City landmark district. It is historic. It is where also the original natural boundaries of the island were. Um, we have about 1.3 million square feet of historic buildings on the north part of the island, which are landmarked and we are, which we are committed to adaptive reuse for. Um, we also have extraordinary open space on the north island. The southern part of the island was added in the early 1900s by Phil um, by the milis mi US military to expand the island. The southern part of the island is where we focused the new park space. And where, because the island was naturally flat as a pancake, we had to add significant grade in order to make sure that that park will remain resilient. As you can see here, the park was developed in two phases. Uh, the first half was opened in 2014, which consists of Liggett Terrace, the hammock groves, and other um, open space facilities. And then more recently, the hills were opened. And those are the four hills that rise on the south more southern tip of the island. Um, this park really came out of an international design competition. We selected West 8 to do the design of the park, in part because they were so focused on delivering really the first truly resilient park in the United States. And so that concept of sustainability and resiliency is stitched into every single design decision that was made for the park. Um, starting really with the desire to raise the topography of the island, protect it from storm surge and sea level rise. Um, and you can see here how the island was elevated, the southern part of the island was elevated up out of the floodplain. Um, but that wasn't all. It isn't just about raising up the topography. We also had a resilient planting strategy. And so what the park designers did and their team was to make sure that we were planting the park, both trees and shrubs and really every you know piece of vegetation you see out there with a great diversity of life so that that way you would have an ecosystem that can survive as New York City's climate starts to change and evolve. Plantings range from really native to New York City all the way down to native to Virginia. The idea being that Again, as climate changes, we will have a park that is diverse enough and adaptive enough to survive that. 
Um, we also were very, very focused on wave action and on making sure that the perimeter of the island is rebuilt to be more resilient. And so we adjusted a lot of the exterior of the island to a construction technology called riprap, which is much better both for longevity but also for um, resiliency issues. And then we reused all of that seawall that we'd taken out as integrated it into the construction of the hills which both served as an extraordinary design feature, but also as a great example of how we can adaptively reuse elements of the island in a way that's actually additive and accretive to the island's forward growth. Stormwater manage management is a critical component of the park's development. Um, and so that too is integrated really into every design feature of the island. On the island, we do not have a combined system. We are able to capture and reuse most of the seawater that comes onto the island. Um, the design is such that it allows that seawater to be directed down into areas of the park that need greater irrigation. Um, and then we have stormwater outfalls um, that then take any water that isn't, of course, reabsorbed and in integrated back into the East River, but that's totally separate from the sewage system. And then coming to our last bucket, of course, as I mentioned, we have tenants and partners um, who are with whom we focus on using the historic space of the island, but also enlivening parts of um, the future development zones uh, for the island. And so what you can see here is that in the northern part of the island, we really currently have four tenants um, who are under long-term lease. First, we will talk about these in more detail. Um, but they're laid out here. They run from being a public school um, to an arts center and actually in the hospitality and amenities bucket, bucket a day spa. So as mentioned during the opening remarks, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council uh, opened the doors of their brand new facility of sep in September of this year. We are really proud of this partnership. Um, it was many years in the making and LMCC has created, I think, a truly special facility out on the island. It serves as a great example of how the historic buildings on the North Island can be adaptively reused and put back into public use. There are two large free public exhibition spaces. LMCC also runs an artist residency program out of this space with dance rehearsal space, with space for multimedia performances, and then individual artist studios. Um, and they, of course, now will be open year or they're open year round in terms of the artist studios and the exhibits are open during the public season. Um, New York Harbor School and Billion Oyster Project were really our first tenants out on the island. They have been there for a number of years. This is a public DOE high school focused on CTE careers in various maritime fields. Um, they are a great, well-regarded public school that draws from all five boroughs and is a real attraction for the island and very much in line, of course, with the island's mission to maintain this as a public resource dedicated to education and also thinking forward about issues of environment, resiliency, and climate. And then, as I mentioned, a day spa is coming. It is under construction now. The doors are expected to open in 2021. Um, that will occupy three buildings on the northern part of the island. People can come, enjoy the day in these pools, looking out over lower Manhattan. Um, and again, one, one more way to draw people out to Governor's Island. And then of course, coming back to the map, um, future development. So of course, we are dedicated to reusing all of this 1.3 million square feet of building on the North Island. We have a ways to go on that. We have a million square feet or so vacant. And then from the days of the master plans creation back in 2020, 2010, excuse me, there have been two development zones allocated on the southern part of the island. This is the area that is contemplated for rezoning. Um, the current plans basically contemplate upzoning those parcels from very low density residential, um, which as alluded to, permanent residential is precluded on the island, to a mid-density sort of mixed-use commercial zone. The northern part of the island was actually rezoned back in 2013 to allow for a broad mix of uses under the deed, but at that time we did not do the southern half of the island, and so we're coming back you know, now to do that. Um, and what we're currently exploring to lead the vision for that southern part of the island is the idea of making Governor's Island a true global center for climate 
adaptation, research, um, advocacy, and education. Uh, we are currently in the research phase of that project. We're working with a consultant to help us think through what exactly a program like that could look like on the Southern Island, but also in some of the North, North Island buildings. That would really, I think, embrace what's special about the island in terms of its access to water, in terms of how it has led on issues of resilience, how we have such strong partnerships in the environmental sector, to really create something on the island that is dedicated to climate solution making, but also to educating a group, a members of the public, to demand that we begin implementation of these solutions. And the island as this extraordinary public resource is positioned well to do both of those things, to help generate the ideas, but also to make sure that we are showing those ideas to the world and helping, again, to make sure that we have st kids, students at the Harbor School, visitors to the island understand what a sort of resilient version of the future looks like. Um, and in this iconic location of Governor's Island, that could have real impact. So um, thank you again for having us. Um, that was our actually sh hopefully fairly brief version to catch everyone up on what's been going on on the island and we are happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge you've been joined by Council Member Cohen. Hello, hello. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I, I, I wanted to um, reference the Times article from um, last month, I think it was October. Mm -hmm. Um, that was talking about the city sent uh, a request for proposals to contractors. Uh, what other, I if for the southern part of the island to sell to, uh, to other partners, what other ideas have been submitted so far aside from what we've seen? Great question. Um, so the RFP that was referenced in the New York Times article was actually um, only sent to con research consultants, um, specifically with the idea of helping us to think through this idea, the idea of um, really bringing a climate center to the island. You know, the island um, has been studied very uh, much over the past 15 years or so. We've done RFEIs out there, we've done RFPs, we've sure. had numerous different consultant teams look at what could work on the island, we've had public input processes for the island. And so I'd say this latest idea is really building on a lot of that thinking and work which is, has often focused on the idea of bringing education or research as an anchor use, and then pairing that into what is, I think, a logical fit for the island and also just something we are all as a city focused on today, which is making sure we are prepared for climate change. And the, uh, and the plan is still to, to make Governor's Island into uh, a living laboratory for climate change? Yes, um, and so as part of the research, the living laboratory idea is something we are very focused on. Um, and it's something that I think others who, with whom we've talked to on the Community Advisory Council and tenants are very excited about. You can imagine walking around the island and seeing, I don't know, uh, the latest carbon capture technology um, demonstrated out there. You can imagine looking at the surrounding waterways and seeing what the latest thinking is in terms of resilient engineering. And so bringing that forward into the public space um, as something exciting for visitors to experience, uh, we, we, are, we believe would be a core part of this plan. So do you see something like the spa as, as a sort of gateway drug to get people to come <laughs> check it out? Um, I le I'm going to use that analogy in the future. Um, no, but we do think that hospitality and amenity are going to be a key component to really any use that we see out there, but it is especially, I think, attractive for educational or research users, um, that people um, need a place to stay. And overnight accommodation, the spa is not this, but in the hospitality bucket, is important both for bringing audience to the island, but also allowing um, to have people experience it, not just from 10 to six, but that 24 hour um, look. But the reality is that the island needs things like uh, places to eat, places to have a drink, uh, hotel, spa to fill out that amenity bucket and um, yes help be a gateway drug um i know you said the ferry costs three bucks right mm -hmm. round trip yes so what's what's the the cost to operate that what's the subsidy on that uh it it's still S mostly subsidized yeah. so the co the cost of the ferry for us is about six million dollars a year and that includes both the service to BMB and to Brooklyn, and we generate currently from uh, the ferry revenue about six hundred thousand dollars a year. 
is have you seen an increase in ridership or what's been the trend since they expanded with NYC Ferry? Yeah. Sorry, I just needed to put my mic on. Um, I can answer that. Um, we've seen um, the new ferry has allowed us to carry an additional few thousand passengers on a given Saturday or Sunday. Um, we are currently operating that ferry on weekends only, but intend to expand that in the future. Um, a few other just broader interesting trends we've seen is a growth in weekday visitorship, um, which I think is really important, as Claire mentioned earlier in her testimony, to sort of putting Governor's Island on the mental map of New Yorkers and having it be woven into the everyday fabric of the city. Um, the Friends of Governor's Island conduct a visitor survey each year um, that analyzes zip code data. Um, we've seen kind of an increase in visitorship from not just Manhattan and Brooklyn, but all five boroughs. Um, I think part of that can be attributed to NYC Ferry, um, increasing our <coughs> connectivity. Um, last year, I believe we saw a 12% increase in visitors from Queens, um, and um, roughly 90% of all New York City zip codes are represented in our visitorship. So um, that's something that we're really, um, that's really important to us, that the island is not just a resource for nearby neighborhoods, but really for the entire city. How long are most people staying? Are they staying all day? That's a good question. I think many people do take a day trip there, but I think on average visitors spend about four to six hours. Mm. And I, I guess in light of some of the, the proposed redevelopment or the imagining for it on, on the southern part of the island, are we considering um, two things? Are we considering additional, uh, are we anticipating an additional need for transportation also what other infrastructure improvements are we anticipating? Yeah, um, and uh, as, as alluded to, the EIS is obviously we're in the midst of that and working to um, look at all of the growth and what the impact will be on infrastructure. But yes, we will certainly need to dramatically expand ferry access, um, both in terms of what we, the trust, are offering with respect to the service back and forth from the Battery Maritime Building, but we do also work closely with EDC to contemplate ways to, um, you know, better stitch into NYC Ferry as growth continues. Um, we also have a capital plan that looks out into the future as growth occurs, and we very closely make sure that the city capital investments are aligning well with the expected demand of infrastructure as new growth happens on the island. Um, we have plans for additional sewer service upgrades. We have plans to add electric service upgrades, and we also will one day in the future add a second water line from Brooklyn. So those are a few of the highlights. <coughs> Sounds like you're preparing more than some other neighborhoods should be preparing. Th thank you, we appreciate that. <laughs> um, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by uh, Councilwoman Adams and Councilman Borelli. Um, <laughs> um, I guess, I, how much, how much thought in your meetings is being put towards making sure we have that, that we strike that balance between mm -hmm. the retail or high-end retail hotel kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I liked hearing that the, pro the, the majority of the programs are free, mm -hmm. um, but how much talk is, or how much you know, priority is being given to, to making sure that, that the public access piece is, is priority? Yeah, I mean, I think the, honest answer to that is that that really is the end all and be all of our mission and so really everything we do on the island has to be in service of making sure that Governor's Island is always an extraordinary public resource for New Yorkers and that is the center of all of the planning we do and so while there will be additional development on the island in the future um, one of the things we talk about actively, both ourselves, but also with our board and um, in conversations with City Hall, is making sure that the island never feels like a place that is privatized. Right, yeah. um, and that amenities that are on the island are publicly accessible. And we mean that from the sense of actual, the physical feel of welcoming, but also price point. Um, and so those kinds of considerations have to be at the core of all of the development that happens out there. I. I Nothing we're talking about today, I think, would, um, the retail and sort of more luxury or high-end components of this will always be relatively de minimis compared to, you know, the fabulous open space, um, compared to working with nonprofits in the environment or arts and culture sector in, 
in or compared to the educational programming we continue to bring to the island. Okay, that's good to know. It's good to that's that's good to know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it all sounds great. I just think I, I, you want to be careful not to create sort of an air of exclusivity yeah. Yeah. with this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, all right, I want to turn it over to uh, Chairman Koo. We've been, we've been joined by Councilman Jonai. Uh, I want to turn over to Chair Koo for some questions Thank as well. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Newman. <coughs> so what are the current budget requirements uh, for Governance Island, and how much of that is the city responsible for? Sure. Um, our current operating budget for the island is about $20 million a year. Um, that covers the cost of, as I mentioned, operating the ferry. It covers the cost of maintaining, of course, the historic buildings on the northern part of the island um, and running all of the public programming that we were discussing earlier. Of that $20 million, about $16 million comes from the city, and the other $4 million is various forms of earned revenue. Mm. And over time, um, of course, we are focused on increasing the share of earned revenue. So what is the projected operating budget for next year's season? Next year, we will probably be right stabilized at around $20 million again. $20 million. <coughs> so uh, what is the timeline for completing, for completely opening up uh, Governor Islands uh, year-round rather than on a summer and, and seasonal basis? Sure. Um, <coughs> it's something that we continue to make strives for each year. We try and increase access. Um, there is, of course, always a balancing act between that and our budget restrictions. So opening up year-round uh, continues to be our goal. And again, we hope to each season expand access until we achieve that. And actually, Sarah, maybe you can talk a little bit about moves we've made over the past 10 years to expand access? Sure. Um, so when the island first opened to the public, it was opened for a few select weekends in the summer. Um, and over time, as Claire mentioned, we've really expanded access. Um, just in 2017, we um, went from a four-month public season to a six-month public season. So we are now open from May through the end of October. Um, and that's been really interesting to witness um, seeing visitors enjoy the <coughs> island in three seasons, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so it's not just a summer getaway anymore. It's, it's really, um, again, part of the um, fabric of the city. Um, we've also experimented with um, expanding our hours during the summer. So last year, we um, were open until 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays um, from Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend. Um, and that allowed us to add some additional programming um, we did a free outdoor film series for the first time um, in partnership with Film at Lincoln Center, um, which I think attracted some folks to the island that may not have come just um, to visit a park. Um, but we also, the park was completely open, so people had the opportunity to see the sunset over the harbor, um, enjoy programming from some of our other cultural partners, and enjoy um, sort of the added food and beverage on the island. So if you want to expand the season, you know, how much funding, how much more funding you need? Th that's a great question. It's a question we're actually answering right now. Peter um, has his checkbook out. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we would be more than happy to get back to you with the um, exact answer to that question in the coming weeks. All right. So does the trust keep track of the number of people that visit the island on a daily or on a seasonal basis? Uh, both. So we have, we do track every single day. I think I'll just flip back here for a second. Mm. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we've seen a lot of growth on the weekdays, which we're very excited about. Um, there we go. So um, average on weekdays is about 2,800, and on the weekends, it goes up to about 7,000 per day. Um, but on popular weekends, or if there's a big event, we can see upwards of 20,000 visitors a day. So this is the la last year's? Or? Yes, uh, on the screen uh, are last year's numbers. We'd be happy to provide more information just about the growth. Um, uh, but we do track um, visitor traffic coming from all ferry lines. Um, and then in addition, our partners at the Friends of Governors Island conduct that visitor survey that gives us kind of a better look at our um, demographics each year. Okay, um, then does the deal uh, between the city and the federal government uh, define partner? 
and how uh, jurisdiction over such parkland will be divided between the city and the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does go into some detail around that. So effectively what the deed from the federal government does is it there is an overt requirement that X acres of the island be um, continue to serve as a, excuse me, trying to get to the slide itself and I'm going the wrong way, um, park and open space. Um, we have met that commitment of the deed, although of course <coughs> we will actually we've exceeded it. Um, all the park that's there today and all the open space that's there today will stay. Um, and the deed requires that that commitment always be honored. In addition, um, when the federal government disposed of the property to us, there was a sort of parallel sister deed to the National Park Service, which of course m keeps that demarcated as a national monument, which will always operate as a park and open space for the public. Okay, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier that the island use uh, seawater. Mm -hmm. uh, is it you use seawater to? Oh, seawall, the seawall. No, no, the, oh. the, the sewage. I'm talking oh, about yes. Yep. You don't have a combined sewage system. No, separate, use, totally you separate. You use seawater to flush the toilets? Oh, um, no, we use w water. Fresh water? Yeah, fresh water, but um, when water goes down the drain, um, the storm water is separated from sewage water. And so the storm water is mostly reused in the park, um, and whatever is not is put back into the East River, whereas the sewer water, or the water that goes down the drain in the sink, goes back into the city sewage system. Oh, okay. okay. But it's good, because when it rains heavily, there's no issue of the sewage system being yeah, overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah. okay, yeah. I'm can I finish my question? Cool, thank you, Chair. Uh, any of my colleagues have questions? You guys are all good? Okay, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have our first panel. First and only panel. Let's make it good. Um, no pressure. Oh, you have more? You have more? Okay. Okay, cool. So we have uh, Margaret Flanagan from the Waterfront Alliance, and we have Marissa Demonakis or Domenicus from Earth Matter. You just got to fill out a, a thing, yeah. Thank you. We also have Mary Birnbaum from Friends of Governors Island who's just signing in. Thank you. Okay, you, you guys can start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for hosting and inviting Earth Matter to submit testimony. This past season, Earth Matter, in partnership with the Trust, processed 38 tons of food scrap generated by visitors, vendors, and events. We take in all of GI's yard trimmings, too. This year, our total combined compost is 520 tons. This translates to serving 25 hundred households preventing what would otherwise be carted far, far away into landfills or incinerators. Next year, with the increased visibility of our joint Zero Waste Island initiative, which we call ZWI, we anticipate the volume of GI-generated food scraps will double. I'm Marissa D. Dominicus. I'm the ED of Earth Matter. We're a nonprofit dedicated to reducing waste and improving soil health through local composting. We have collaborated with the Trust, formerly GIPEC, since 2009 to develop GI into a closed loop. The crux of the Trust mission is sustainability. Under Claire Newman's leadership of the Jewel of New York Harbor, they are putting GI in the forefront of helping New Yorkers embrace composting as a basic way that each of us can recover our own resources, limit our waste, which mitigates our destructive contributions to climate change. Since hosting the first ZWI event and setting up the public source separations, the Trust has always embraced our work. <coughs> Recently, they provided a three-year land use agreement for one acre of our site on the urban farm located in the Eastern Development Zone. 
this agreement provides us with grounding needed to grow our funding partners. Earth Matter, with the help of our chickens, our goats, our worms, provides a place for people to get hands-on composting and environmental education. Hey, Merritt. We serve over 13,000 people directly every year. People need to see in order to believe that their food scraps are composted locally. And we feel honored to have a home on Governor's Island, which allows us to give and receive from all the people we meet and greet and are privileged to work with. Our Compost Learning Center is a DEC registered compost facility and we're supported from the Department of Sanitation. We process neighbor food, <laughs> neighbor food scraps, and, uh, which is also funded from Department of Sanitation from the Green Market Program. Where does all of our compost go? Most of it will go back to the GI landscape where New Yorkers play and get away. Composting reduces the direct cost of waste disposal and its associated carbon footprint. Compost use for soil stabilization, erosion control, and nutrient retention is an essential part of any resiliency plan involving planting. It reduces the need for fertilizer and resulting nutrient runoff into the harbor, which can degrade marine life. The GI horticultural staff focus on planting native species has had a measurable increase in the diversity of bird life, in fact, GI rivals Central Park in this regard. The, tra the trust is on track for doing their part to steward our public land and identify new partners who can help develop the island as a model of a livable world of tomorrow. Council members, we know you share our dream of a green city. I humbly request that you expand all you do to create policies and incentives for a more resilient and sustainable New York City. Can you increase funding for education around all three things, zero by 50? Can you increase funding to all New York City parks so staff can compost leaves and, e and create their own local compost hubs? These measures would help the greening of New York City in a big, big way. Thank you for your continued support of the trust endeavors and thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, there you go. Um, uh, thank you. Good morning, council members, and hello to everyone. I'm Maggie Flanagan from the Waterfront Alliance, and I'm going to summarize the written uh, testimony where you have full details. Waterfront Alliance brings together more than 1,100 stakeholders all coming together in support of a common mission to have resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. In 2018, Waterfront Alliance was engaged by the Trust for Governors Island to produce a maritime activation plan. It was for us building on a previous uh, year's work we did with Brooklyn Bridge Park and an activation then plan there. And it also built upon the great work the Trust has been doing that uh, Claire has described all these years all along. And um, we're really proud that the Maritime Activation Plan um, adds to the lists of plants that you all mentioned as well, but is particularly unique in that it looks to the role of Governor's Island as the pearl of New York Harbor, truly central to the maritime essence of our city as well. So uh, Maritime Activation Plan, or MAP for short, examines how the trust could make the most of the unique waterfront assets of Governor's Island while also addressing real challenges that exist living on the waterfront in New York City and being responsible for the public waterfront there. Uh, maps are created with input from dozens and dozens of s local stakeholders, maritime experts. We interview folks locally and nationally in order to get some of the best minds thinking about how to make those connections. So as the trust moves forward with the transformation of Governor's Island into a dynamic year-round destination, maximizing the waterfront is gonna be critical uh, along with other steps in achieving those goals. Uh, we are summarized uh, our main findings into four different categories. We call them getting there, ferry transportation, of course, enjoying island life, all the amazing programming that you already heard about, moving the goods, 
all of the freight, construction, stuff people use on the island uh, has to be handled, and maximizing management, which is uh, continuing to build the expertise and integration that the trust has already provided for the island. So I'll just offer some specifics on those topics. Uh, key to ferry service, um, we propose re-equipping Yankee Pier, investing in Yankee Pier to add more ferry slips and allow more runs to end there. Uh, the plan also calls uh, out the importance of access from around uh, distant areas of the region, as you all are paying attention to as well. But anything involving the ferries, as you asked council members with your question, does involve serious concerns of operation and finances, and the Maritime Activation Plan also provides some additional insight on that as well. Uh, for uh, diverse programming, which this trust has already done so much to build, we ask that uh, the plan suggests that it continue to focus on the waterfront as well. Um, again, investment is needed to create a protected water touch point, but we um, propose examining creating a place on the island where people could actually touch the water in a cove or get down. Uh, the plan uh, highlights some of the potential of Piers 101 and 101 to continue to support on-water programming as is already being done by the trust there. And uh, as you all mentioned, uh, Council Member Koo in particular, to invite more boaters to the island, perhaps figure out a way to include a mooring field or encourage um, uh, marinas to be part of those future, um, uh, or some kind of waterfront access to be part of the future development uh, that happens in the island. Uh, for moving the goods, for freight access, there's so much behind the scenes that the trust has already worked so hard to manage. And we think key to that support is um, providing a service entrance pier for the island. So perhaps Lima Pier can be rebuilt to receive freight barges that serve the island and help make future construction as well as handling materials easier. And then again, for management, the trust has done so much work already, and we uh, propose that it be continued uh, to be expanded and that management continues to integrate the waterfront with the operations and uplands of the island. So some uh, specifics to be aware of in that is uh, waterfront operations always include some necessary upland space. So as the trust continues to um, integrate things well, to remember things like kayak storage area or staging areas for the trucks near the pier and the barges will be an essential component of that planning. And uh, we also um, applaud the trust's efforts to manage all the waterfront and uh, suggest to continue to increase that by adding a maritime specialist, someone perhaps with a resume that includes um, ferry work and or SUNY Maritime that has the lingo and the contractual uh, expertise that has already been done very well, but can continue um, to enable you all to grow more when, we, when, we, when that area is strengthened. We completely agree that Governor's Island could be an incredible model for climate resilient hub and education as you described. Um, carrying on the great work started by original tenants like the Harbor School and Billion Oyster Project. And Waterfront Alliance also has a WEDGE program, water Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. And WEDGE uh, puts together best practices for balancing resilience, ecology, and access in the complex world of waterfront design. And so uh, we're continuing to um, be pleased to have tools to offer to support the great work of the trust. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Councilwoman Rivera. Uh, and we have Merritt Barenbaum from Friends of Governors Island. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Friends of Governors Island. Uh, for context, the Friends was originally established as Governors Island Alliance in 1995, and as Claire mentioned in her overview, um, we were really founded as a sub-project of the Regional Plan Association with a mission to uh, turn over Governors Island to the people of New York to become a great resource. Um, Obviously, we succeeded, and uh, since that time, we have retooled our mission. Uh, more recently, we recognized the need for an independent nonprofit to uh, support the island with volunteers and private fundraising. 
So in 2014, we officially received our 501c3 status and uh, really re-envisioned our mission and our name uh, to be dedicated to taking care of the park and enhancing the public experience of the island, working very, very closely with the Trust and the National Park Service. Um, so we work with the Trust to provide funding and volunteer opportunities and resources to keep the island green, sustainable, vibrant. Uh, we also run a visitor services program, which was also mentioned, that focuses on providing the information, guides, and amenities, such as a small retail outfit, uh, so that the public can take full advantage of everything the island has to offer. Um, we also work to build a community for the island, which is challenging given that it is not in anyone's backyard as their, their neighborhood. So we run a membership program, we recruit and train volunteers, and we also produce a number of free public events. Uh, I think uh, the, the visuals in the presentation today and everything that Claire mentioned certainly um, touched on Governor's Island's uniqueness. It really is a place for all New Yorkers and it's not tied to any one neighborhood or demographic. Uh, so today I just wanted to give a very brief update on our activities and our organizational growth, which has been really exciting. So in the past five years since becoming a, a new nonprofit, uh, we have tripled our annual budget to $1.8 million in the past year. Uh, so with this increased capacity, we've been able to achieve a few things. One is this year, and this is something that we have been building towards, we helped to fund the island's first year round team of professional gardeners to take care of the park. So when the park was completed in 2016, it was under warranty until 2017. Um, there was a lot of work that needed to be done where there wasn't professional gardening staff in place because it wasn't needed before. So with all of these uh, new exciting landscapes, really needing to um, increase the amount of support and maintenance that's going into caring for the park. Um, that's an area where, since there was no increase in the operating budget for the, the trust, uh, the friends came in to really start uh, turning to the private sector, similar to other park models, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Hudson River Park, Central Park Conservancy, Highline, to, um, to turn to the community of users and people who love and support the island to, to help us uh, fundraise for uh, the gardening staff. So we were very successful this year in transitioning from more of a seasonal base to a year-round team of gardeners uh, to help take care of the park. Uh, we also operated the two welcome centers that Claire mentioned at the ferry landings, uh, providing the, the amenities and the free guided tours to the public. Uh, part of our mission has always been to engage volunteers. This was our most successful year. We had 2,400 volunteers, both individuals and corporate groups who contributed over 14,000 hours of service to the island, which is the equivalent of about six full-time staff members. Uh, we also produced a couple of major free public events, uh, a spring volunteer festival and a fall pumpkin patch that's very popular and has brought about 20,000 people to the island combined uh, over several weekends. And then uh, in the good news on our uptick for fundraising, we held our most successful fundraising gala uh, raising over $1.1 million, uh, which all went into these amenities for the island. There's a huge gap that we still need to fill. We're still not fully covering the cost of these gardeners. And it's something that we've been, as I mentioned, tripling the budget. We have ambitious goals to, to continue with that level of growth over the next couple of years to really meet uh, the demand of this incredible world-class park, but it does require a world-class level of maintenance to, to take care of. Uh, so I just want to thank you for calling today's uh, hearing and for the opportunity to testify for a place that is really at the cutting edge of environmental sustainability and resiliency and providing an incredible open space resource for uh, a city that is often lacking in those types of amenities. Thank you. Right on. Thank you. Uh, any of my colleagues have questions? No, I have a question. Okay. Chair Coe. Yeah, I have a question for uh, uh, Ms. Wimban. Yeah. Yeah, how, how, where do you draw your membership from? So our membership program started uh, three years ago, and it's uh, similar to other park memberships. We have a $50 uh, opening 
contribution. Uh, we have deals with the vendors on the island that give discounts to members. Uh, we offer a number of free tours and events and things for the membership. Um, we have about uh, 300 active members now. Um, the program has been pretty flat. So one of the things that we're looking to do um, next year is have a $25 price point for membership uh, to try to increase that uh, to a, a broader base of people. It's been, I think, a little challenging just because um, we, are, we marketed to the people who come to the island already and we've sort of saturated that point. So hopefully kind of reaching out with a, a lower price point. We also offer a free membership to um, NYCID holders for their first first year uh, joining as members and we send a lot of member communications try to engage them in volunteer opportunities and events and things that are happening on the island. I mean uh, do they live in the neighborhood? Uh, it's very broad mm -hmm. the island draws from all over the city so um, I would say that the majority of our members live in Brooklyn and Manhattan similar to um, the distribution of visitors coming to the island, but we definitely have members from Staten Island, Bronx, and Queens um, who come to the island regularly as well. And, and this also apply to the to the volunteers, right? Yes, the volunteer population is extremely diverse, uh, coming from all over the city and often from places where they just don't have um, a space like Governor's Island. People who want to come and work on the landscapes and garden. Uh, coming from very far afield. We've even had people come volunteer from New Jersey and Pennsylvania and take the train into the city for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, service. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys very, very much. And with that, we are adjourned.